United stands, I'm Mark Goldbridge and this is your latest Manchester United news and transfer news as Ineos send a strong warning to Manchester United fans about the future and about what's about to happen in the summer transfer window. We're also going to be talking about Kobe Mainu is set to make his first start for England tonight. That's going to be a big opportunity for him. Some people are saying... Is it too much too soon? I don't think it is, but there you go. Fabrizio Romano doubling down in the last few minutes that Manchester United have a plan in place to buy a left back this summer. Has that now superseded the ability to get a right back at Manchester United? Is it another warning that we're not going to do everything in this magnificent mega summer that it's meant to be? Uh, we'll also talk about Bruno Fernandes. He's back in Manchester. Uh, a lot of people in the chat popping off this morning about, uh, about Eric Ten Hag and getting rid of Ten Hag again, uh, which I find quite interesting. Um, but look, I think that the, the first place to start here is that we spoke about Ivan Tony last night and I apologise for not bringing this into the show last night and it's sort of where we're well, it fits in with what we're going to start off with here. We've already had the warning from Sir Jim Radcliffe that they don't want to spend big money on the likes of Kylian Mbappe. But Kylian Mbappe is relative. If Kylian Mbappe is going to cost you £200 million, that's because he's the best player in the world. Ivan Tony is Kylian Mbappe. That's not me comparing Kylian Mbappe or Ivan Tony. What I'm saying is Mbappe's value probably is £200 million, top. Um, Ivan Tony's value top is probably 70 million. Paying 200 million for Mbappe is the same as paying 70 million for Ivan Tony in relation to what Sir Jim Radcliffe is saying. They don't want to pay top dollar for, for reputational players anymore. He wants to go into areas where you're bringing through the next Kylian Mbappe or the next Ivan Tony. And I think that we didn't bring this into the show last night, but it's probably true. Ivan Tony is going to be top heavy expensive. You are going to play pay the top value for him. It's the same as going for someone like Ollie Watkins and paying £100 million. I don't believe we're going to do that. In the last 24 hours, we've been linked to... And you can tell me the names. We've been linked to an AC Milan 16-year-old. We've been linked to a Boca Juniors uh, teenager as well. Uh, there's somebody else, I think, from, from France that we're looking at as well. I don't think this is in any way, shape or form a shock, a surprise as to what we're going to do. And I think that with the news coming out that we're going for a left back as well, realism around this summer transfer window has to be lost um, or found in the statements that are coming out of the club. I do not think that, the, the as I've said, the Zhao Neves story is fantasy. It's absolutely fantasy. As Jim said, they're basically trying to find bargains. That's the warning. That's the revolution. That's going to make some people happy. It's going to make some people sad. Rio Ferdinand was saying, it's really exciting that we're just going to buy a load of young players and players for the future. It is. It is. But as I've said before with Ineos, you're not there to kiss their ass forever they married that they've married themselves now we've been to the we've been to the party we've been to the reception now the reality bikes and with every uh, good thing that they do there'll be people who say I don't agree with that I think you've got to go and get out you, you have got to go and buy an Ivan Tony you have got to go and buy an Ollie Watkins yes bring younger players through but you've still got to bring in um players that are going to make us better instantly because younger players are going to take a bit of time aren't they I think it's really interesting. Um, I do. I really, really do. And I think what, what, Sir, what Sir Jim Radcliffe has basically said is no more superstars. That's not what we're going to look at. And Fabrizio Romano has said that the priority positions are now left back, centre back, striker, and then potentially a midfielder. So that, that's four priorities, but it's not seven or eight players, is it? Um I think we still will buy five or six players. I still think we will. But it's really interesting how, you know, Fabrizio is well sourced. Man United are now going for a left back. Are we going to go for a right back? Are we going to buy two centre backs or are we going to buy one? What I'm trying to say is, is there a bit of a warning here that we may actually not buy that many players in the summer? I mean, Fabrizio himself said buying a second centre back depends on what happens with Harry Maguire. So, what you know, we're, we already know McTominay's going to stay. We already know that Rashford's going to stay. We already know that Bruno's going to stay. If Maguire stays, are you telling me we're buying one centre back, one left back and a striker? I mean, that's that's a pitiful summer transfer window to what we need. We need a revolution. We don't need a, you know, we don't need one or two players. Are, are we keeping wan -Bissaka now? as well as Delo, and we're not going to do anything at right back, even though we've been looking for a right back for three years. I think um, Michael says there'll be a maximum of four players signed, in my opinion. The bottom line is we just don't know. And I think we have to take a warning. My opinion and theory is that we will see 
at least 10 players go out the door and six or seven come in the door. But that's a theory. Reality is we might see five or six go, uh, of which obviously you're going to see Greenwood, Martial, Donny and Ericsson go. I mean, they're open goals. They're, they're, two of them are walking out for nothing. So, you know, we can sell five players without blinking. We need, you know, to have a real impact, we need to sell 10. Well, what if, what if we don't sell 10? What if we sell five or six and we only bring in two or three? Like, is that the revolution, the summer transfer window that's going to make Ten Hag's job easier, going to make us compete next season? I don't think it is. And uh, I think underarching this, there's so many interesting, you know, analytical pieces that you see out there at the moment around this as well. Is this fundamentally, we don't have a lot of money? You know, what's the best way to manipulate a fan base into a strategic transfer window when you haven't got any money? Well, yeah, we, we want to do it little by little. We're only going to get rid of two or three players and we're going to, you know, we're going to bring one or two in. And obviously we, we will do slightly more than that. But you do worry about the financials. Of course you do. Um, I also think as well, um, I'm going to give a, a shout out to a, an account on Twitter, Swedish Ram, uh, Rum, I think it's Swedish Rumble or Swedish Ramble. Um, I forget the name of it. Um, uh, Swedish Rumble it is. And uh, basically they were a very, very good analytical piece talking about how um, Manchester United um, will um, look to make these signings for younger players. And uh, I, I will absolutely murder the name. But we have been linked to a lot of younger players at the moment. And uh, there is a there is a lad, I think he's at Boca Juniors, called Anselmino. Um, and we've been looking to bring him into Manchester United. Well, Real Madrid have now entered the race um, and Manchester United might not get him. Uh, and the point of that is that, you know, Ineos are in charge today. They're not in charge tomorrow. Um, it's their job now to make sure that we're fully operational. Um, you know, and, and, and in that, anything lost, like if a young player that we're looking at goes to Real Madrid, that's on Ineos's watch. If a player that we want to bring to Manchester United, we miss out on now, that's on Ineos watch. It's not Murta, it's not Arnold, and it's not the Glazers anymore. We are Manchester United and their football side is being run by Ineos. Now, are we in a position now where we potentially are missing out on opportunities because Ineos haven't got their balls in place? We know that Barad is on gardening leave until the summer and Dan Ashworth is still on gardening leave with Newcastle. There's this big story that Barad and um, D Dan Ashworth will make the decision on Eric Ten Hag. You know what? Th there's part of me that agrees with that Twitter account that, you know, what's the excuse for his not being fully operational? This is football. It waits for nobody. Nobody. There is no time of the year where you can sit back having a drink on your porch, enjoying yourself and going, that will sort itself out in a few weeks' time. This is football. We need to be on it now. And I do sort of concern myself with the fact that, yeah, Barada and Ashworth will decide on Ten Hag. When are they going to be here then? Like, I want Ten Hag to stay. But if, if Ashworth and Barada are deciding on Ten Hag, they're not even in post and they can't decide on them because they're not in post. So what you're basically saying is you're passing the book to two people who aren't even in post at the moment. Oh, Ashworth would love this 17-year-old from Argentina. He's not even in post. Oh, he's gone to Real Madrid. Oh, Barada would love Manchester United to go out and buy Edison from Atalanta. Oh, he's just signed for Atletico Madrid. Like, what, what are we actually doing? Because I, I agree Rome wasn't built in a day, but Rome, Rome needs to start being built. And there are a number of things at the moment where I just think, you know, even Fabrizio was talking about the striker yesterday. Manchester United are still assessing their options of what they want. It's the March international window and it's, it's the March international break. And it's nearly over. We've got three games next week. Then it's, then it's you know, April whizzes by. Six games in April. Oh, it's May. Oh, it's the summer transfer window. I said this last week. Clubs for years use the March international break to start digging into what players they want. Are United digging into the players they want? And who's doing that? John Murta's still here. Like, what are we actually doing? And look, we have to hold them accountable. Of course we do. Not to the extent that we did the Glazers. God, they need, they need a bit of time. They need a bit of patience. But the concern is Ineos have been buying Manchester United for over a year. Ineos 
basically were announced as the football lead for Manchester United on Christmas Eve. It's Easter on Sunday. We don't have a director of football. On Christmas Eve, if you'd said to me, we won't have a director of football by Easter, I'd have said you're having a bloody laugh. What do you mean we won't have a director of football by Easter? It's Christmas Eve. So we haven't got that. What, you know, the, thing, the wheels are moving slowly. Um, they're moving slowly because Ineos want what they want. And I, I can't argue with that. Sometimes you've got to be patient to get the patient to get the things that you want. But let's not pretend that we aren't going to start missing out on targets. And the minute you start missing out on targets, you fuck up the next season. We've seen it with Van Gaal. We've seen it with Mourinho. We've seen it with Solskjaer. We've seen it with Ten Hag this year. When you mess the summer transfer window up, you normally mess the next season up. So where is this revolutionary action that we expected from Sir Jim Radcliffe? Um, and when are we going to start to see it? Because I think we need to start seeing it ASAP. The Dan Ashworth deal has been rumbling on for fucking weeks. And uh, sorry to swear on a morning show, but who really wins out of this? Are Ineos sat there playing hardball with Newcastle? Who, and why would Newcastle care? Newcastle don't care. Dan Ashworth doesn't work for them anymore. This is about getting one up on your rival. And Man United going, we won't pay too much. We haven't got a director of football, lads. When are we going to get this sorted? It's nearly April. Like we, this Dan Ashworth was going to be our director of football at the start of February. It's now going to be the start of April. We need, we need to... We, it's a mess. I know it's a mess because I know people who work at the club. It's still a mess. The transfer strategy is still a mess. On the one hand, you've got Murta doing a tour around Europe. You've got Ten Hag still in charge. You've got Ashworth can't say a bloody word. You've got Barada not coming in until the summer. You've got Brailsford doing a strategic review. You've got Sir Jim Blanc sticking their nose in as well. And it's a mess. Because basically, they're going, well, Dan Ashworth will have the biggest say with Barada, but they're not there. You know, what are we actually, you know, is Ten Hag going to be here? It's all really messy. So Ten Hag saying the players he wants. Mert is going around with what he's looking at. You know, we, we need to we need to resolve this quickly. And I'm not in any way, shape or form saying that it won't work itself out because it probably will. But we do get to a point where we have to start saying this is going to have a massive impact on this transfer window. And actually, are we already getting to a point where next January transfer window and next summer transfer window are going to be the proper ones. Is this just another, well, we've tried to get things done, but it's not worked out quick enough. So it's going to be next year now because no, no shit, Sherlock. Like last summer transfer window was screwed by the fact that the Glazers didn't sell the club quick enough. And we're still paying that price. We are. We're still. Uh, Ten Hag needs a new contract before any incomings. The last thing we need is new players coming in with a manager on the cliff edge, says Charlie Max. Thank you, Charlie. Ian says, I can see four first team players coming in along with four young project players to develop. Hopefully the younger players get first team game time as well, says Ian. Uh, Patrick says, Chelsea have bought nothing but highly touted young talent. Look how that worked out. Ineos need to be careful. And uh, Gareth says, uh, been one of our members for 10 months. Gareth, big shout out to you. He says, Nathan Collins would be great at United. He's still young and Premier League and we should look at Barbosa as well, says Gareth. Well, God knows what we're looking at at the moment. I mean, I want to talk about a couple of other things, but Fabrizio Romano this morning doubling down on a left back, basically saying that Manchester United have been looking at a left back now for a long time. It's a left back that will be a young left back who comes in as an understudy for Luke Shaw. It, I'm getting, I feel like, I feel like Beyonce, I'm getting a bit of the deja vu here. Um, we've been in this position before. So basically, read between the lines. We spoke about it last night. Malassia is done at United, isn't he? For whatever reason, I'm sure we'll find out. We're, we're basically looking for Malassia again. And um, nobody can do anything about that. You know, I don't blame Ten Hag. I don't blame Arnold. I don't blame Murta. Malassia for 15 million quid was like Dan James for 15 million quid. 15 million quid these days, you, you know, you can afford. You can afford to make a mistake uh, when you're paying that amount of money. Um, but, but, again, you know, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. And, and I feel that have we now squandered the opportunity to get a bloody right back in? Because there is no talk of a right back at the moment. Fabrizio didn't mention it yesterday. It's now not a priority position, apparently. A left back's a priority. Well, it wouldn't be if Malassia was OK. So, again, like, are we now sacrificing a position we actually need to improve on 
to go and get a position that we desperately have to get because we haven't got anybody else. Um, you know, it doesn't make me happy that we're going to buy a left back. I, my 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 feeling is about a new left back is, mm, you know, I, I, I never get excited about replacing a player that's injured, you know, and, and, and we were OK at left back. Um, and now we've got to go and fill a hole because this is what happens in football. This is always what happens. We need a midfielder. We need a striker. We need a centre back. We don't sort that out. And by the time the next summer transfer window comes out, there'll be another problem like a left back that becomes more urgent than the other positions. So, yeah, we're going to buy a left back. But I'm not excited about it. I'm not excited about it. I want two centre backs. I want a right back. I want a midfielder. I want a striker. I don't really want a left back. I understand we've got to go and get one. But, you know, it's like it's like you want to, it's, it's like in your house, you really want to. You got some money and you really want to turn your living room into a modern cinema room and you've saved up to do it. You're just about to get somebody in to start doing it for you. And the wife says, you won't believe it. The shower's leaking. It's knackered. We need a new shower. I've already got a bloody shower. Yeah, but it's broken. We need a new one. Oh, so I can't have my cinema room now. No, the shower is leaking. We need to get a new shower done. I've already bloody had a shower. Yeah, but this one's broken. So I can't have my cinema room then, can I? No, no, you've got to spend the money on And that's exactly what's happening now with left back. You know, Frimpong, Edison, Gomez, whatever. Midfielder or right back. Probably bin it now because we've got to go and get a left back because the left back's broken. Um, and that's not me being insensitive. You know, there could be some horrific reason why Malassia is not going to play for Man United. We, we don't know. But it doesn't make it any more exciting. It's not exciting. Um, and Thuto says we have players at right back. But that's not how you move forward, Thuto. That's not how you move forward as a football club. We're Manchester United and we're bloody miles off the title. Oh, we've got centre-backs as well. Should we not buy any there? Oh, guess what? Rashford can play up front, maybe not buy a striker. I tell you what, let's not buy anybody because, you know, we've got centre-backs. We've got right-backs. They're not bloody good enough, mate. They're not good enough. Wake up and smell the bloody coffee. Get out of bed. Have a shower and wake up. What are you talking about? We've got right backs. They're not good enough. They're not good enough. Our right backs and our centre backs aren't good enough to cause Man City a problem. They're not good enough to cause Arsenal a problem. They're good players. I like wan and I definitely like Delo, but they're not good enough. Those right backs are not good enough. You need Delo and wan to be sold, or you need to sell Delo and keep wan we need a different pro profile of right back. You know, we 100% do. And we definitely need, do need it at set back, uh, centre back. And now we've got to buy a left back. It, it's, just, it's just relentless bloody problems for Manchester United. Hi, Mark. We're on the train from Manchester Wem to Wembley for the game tonight. Can you call Phil a Pratt, says Ashley. Phil, you're a Pratt. Um, and morning, Mark. We have a left back. Just need to bring him... Back off loan from Benfica, says Andy. Yeah, I think you're talking about Alvaro, Fernandez, and he won't be there. Super Dan says, I disagree about that, Mark. Um, good, good. Welcome to the world of having an opinion. So you think Delo and wan are good enough to challenge Man City? Well, I'd love to see the evidence of this. I'd love to see the evidence of this. Delo, maybe, because he can play the way that we want to play. wan is a back four right back. We don't want to play a back four. We want to play fullbacks that get forward, invert, overlap the lot. wan is never going to be that. We don't want to play a flat back four. We don't want to play ollie ball. We want to play on the front foot, higher up the pitch, and therefore we're going to need a more attacking right back than wan -Bissaka. But people, I like wan because he's so good at tackling. Those last-ditch slide tackles are mint. He is so good defensively. Salah in his pocket. Yeah, all true. All very, very true. But we don't want to play like that, do we? You don't like that style of football. Oh, just parking a bus at home to Liverpool. What are we doing? Fucking hell. So, on the one hand, wan is the solution. On the other hand, you don't want to play defensive football. He can't go forward. He can't go forward. So, um, yeah, look, I, I don't know what Beth's talking about as well. She can do one. You've got your own show to talk about it, Beth. I haven't said Delo's not good enough. I said our right backs aren't good enough. We need to sell wan and bring another right back in so that we've got another right back who can do what Delo potentially can do. I still think the jury's out on Delo. I still think it's out. Really like him. Really good player. 
but we have a tendency in this fan base to overrate players and overhype them. I've heard people saying Delo's better than Trent Alexander-Arnold. I mean, this is the sort of shit that that, that, that makes us be where we are. Um, I think Delo is the right type of right back and I think Luke Shaw is the right type of left back, but we're definitely going to need another left back and another right back, in my opinion, um, to move forward. Um, Ray says right back's not a priority. Ray, it is. It is a priority. You're just lazy. We, of course it's a bloody priority. You know what, Ray? You should go and work for the Glazers. They'd love you. What do you mean it's not a priority? So let's keep... Let's have the low. And when he gets injured and we haven't got a right back that can push forward anymore, we'll go back to playing deep again, will we? So uh, uh, according to Ray, I don't think a centre-back's a priority either, is it? Because when Varane and Martinez are injured, we can play Evans and Maguire. And we can drop 20 yards and play on the edge of our box. Every position is a priority that is going to allow us to play the way that we want to play. So the way that we want to play is two centre-backs on the halfway line with full-backs who've got licence to go forward and invert. That is what we want to do. And we also want an, a striker that can press from the front like Rasmus. So we need a striker who can press from the front like Rasmus. We need full-backs who are attacking full-backs, who are intelligent enough to invert into the midfield and overlap as well. And we need centre-backs who can play on the halfway line. So I'm sorry, Ray, there are priorities. We need full-backs who can do that, which we don't have. We only have Delo, who's fit at the moment. Wambasaka can't do it. Malassia can't do it. And Shaw can't do it because they're injured. We need centre-backs who can play on the halfway line. Only Varane and Martinez can do it. Three of them can't, so that's priority as well. We need another striker like Hoyland, which we don't have. That's a priority as well. The priorities in that team and the staring everybody in the face are another right-back, another left-back, two centre-backs, another Casemiro-type midfielder and a striker. They're the priorities. Elise on the wing isn't a priority. Like that 50 million spend on Elise is not a priority. That is a luxury. But priority, right back, left back, two centre backs, holding midfielder, striker. They're your six, in my opinion, because those six players make us play the way we want to play. Um, anything else is a luxury. Uh, hi, Mark. Looking into the Malassia disappearance, it looks like he's in witness protection. Jacob, anything factual about that or just... Uh... Just, a, just, a, just an internet rumour. Um, Rory says, to close the gap, we need to upgrade the starting eleven. Let those upgraded pad out the squad. Buying squad players won't drive us up the league. Completely agree with that. Ashley says, hi, Mark. We are on the... I've done that one from Ashley. Benfica don't want Alvaro, says JSD. Keep him and we got Amas and go for a left back, says JSD. Yes. Well, I, well I'd love it if we don't buy one. Nigel uh, has been a member for nine months, by the way. Legend to you. And uh, Mud says, we, it's all smoke and mirrors again to justify a bad summer transfer window. Uh, five minutes left till the morning sneeze, says Joseph. Yeah, get ready for that. Um, yeah, look, I think that um, I think the overarching thing before we move on to me is that um, there has to be a reality bite that things are not moving as quick as they should be. And it's on Ineos's watch. Any player that we miss out on, any player, any bad transfers that we miss out on, any good transfers that we miss on, it's not the Glazers now. It's been an Ineos world since Christmas. What is going on? Why aren't things moving quicker? Why is Dan Ashworth not the director of football? Why are we potentially missing out on young players to Real Madrid? Why are things not more clear? You know, what are we actually doing? I think at the moment, we're still stuck in the phase of, oh, so Jim's done another... another spoken about Man United on another cycling podcast. Oh, so Jim's done another interview with the BBC. We've had all that. We're past all that. We don't need projections. We need deliverance. We need some things to actually start happening now. You know, we need to sign the 17-year-old from Boca Juniors and say, look, that's one for the future. Why aren't we doing that? There's nothing stopping us doing that. So Jim Radcliffe and Ineos have been ratified by the Premier League. They are now 30% owners of Manchester United. Why are we waiting? What's going on with Dan Ashworth? You know, I think I think we're in a I think the honeymoon's the honeymoon zone's over. Let's start making some decisions because the transfer window is going to be here before you know it. Uh, James says it would be such a shame to miss out on Frampong's release clause. It's amazing value. Would like to see Alvaro Fernandez come back and get a chance as well. Says James. Thank you very much for that. Well, oh, look, talking about coming back. Um, 
The um, Bruno Fernandes is back in Manchester. Um, he has not played for Portugal in their second international game, so he is back. Uh, in Manchester now, hopefully getting a bit of recuperation, um, more than he would have done. I, I expected him to play in that sec second game for Portugal. So he's back in Manchester, ready to go for the weekend. Um, but not everybody is back. It's a big night. You heard from the lads on the way down to Wembley to watch Man England play against Belgium tonight. Um, interestingly, Kobe Mainu is set to start for England. The Mainu Express keeps on moving, doesn't it? Now, Funny enough, I saw something last night. Uh, I was just sort of uh, getting ready to go to bed and I, I was looking on my phone, as you do, and uh, there was a bit of debate going on about Kobe Mainu and somebody was saying, it's too much too soon. We're going to burn out another English talent. This is what we do. And um, it got me thinking. I thought, I'm going to bring that into the morning show, you know. I mean, I, I don't feel that. I don't feel like it's too much too soon. But I, I must admit, I'm old enough to remember what happened with Rooney. I'm old enough to happen, know what happens with Michael Owen. We, we, we do Jack Wilshire. We do this a lot, you know, and I'm talking about the FA, the England manager. The, the, as soon as there's a sniff of a young player, boom, throw them in, you know, get them starting games of football. And look, I, 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 I don't think... 18 is too young to be being thrown in to start for England. I mean, look, Jude Bellingham has been doing it. Um, I think the most important thing for Mainu from a Manchester United point of view is very separate to all this. Look, it's been a it's been a roller coaster. It's been a whirlwind. Um, his, you know, he really only started playing for United in was it like November, late November. So it's only like a few months later, and he started for England. So I'm really excited to do the watch along tonight, despite the yawn. Um, I am. I'm really excited to do it. And I think that um, he is deserving of the opportunity, of course. And uh, there's no point in calling him up to the England squad and then not giving him a few minutes to see whether you want to take him to the Euros. And I think there's a very big chance he will go to the Euros. Um, of course, look, selfishly, I think there are there are what I would call naive United fans out there who are, I just want him to go to the Euros and play every game and then I want to see him on the US tour and then I want to see him play every game next season. And, and that that is, it's, it's nice. It's a fantasy. Um, no, no player of 18 years of age should be playing 60 plus games in a, in a normal season and then, you know, going into an international tournament and having no time off and then going on a pre-season tour. It's hard enough for a 25-year-old to do that, but Mainu's developing. Ganacho's developing. Like an 18-year-old shouldn't just be playing three games a week for the and and will not play three games a week for the rest of his career. There has to be somewhere some sort of break. Now it might be after the Euros. Ten Hag says you're not coming on the US tour. Have two weeks off, and we'll start the season without you. And you will you we, we will have a, a separate fitness plan for you to be ready. Sort of back arse of August because if England win the Euros give him two weeks off completely maybe even three weeks off and then get him back to Carrington and slowly feed him back in um, that's that's what I would do it's not it's not ideal I mean look selfishly I don't want him to go to the Euros because the season will finish at the end of end of May he'll get all of June off and then he'll be back on pre-season ready to go because it, it's the body development as well as the mental and physical development as well. But that we, we, we shouldn't deprive him of going to the Euros with England when that's what he wants to do. And ultimately, it's up to Southgate, isn't it? So I get why people want him to go to the Euros. I get why he wants to go. Selfishly, I don't. I'd rather I put Man United ahead of England. But what we're going to have to do is factor in some break for him. We can't just go... All of this season, Euros, US Tour, all of the next season, that's just not going to work. You can't do that. We're going to have to find a way to manage his body uh, and game time. And it probably falls on us because Southgate's going to take him, isn't it? But that's that's on Manchester United. We know we've got to do a lot of work on the physical, physical conditioning of our players. So look, I, I don't think it's too much too soon. I think when somebody deserves something, it's never you're never too young to get it, are you? And, and it's very... Exciting what's happening with Mainu. My biggest concern with Mainu actually is, and it got me thinking about this, is, um, you know, and it will be exciting. I mean, I'm looking forward to the Euros. I think England have got a great chance of winning it. And, you know, Mainu playing in that would be, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a Man United player, isn't it? So that's very, very exciting. I just worry about 
you know, where he's going to get a break because he's going to need a break. But no, I don't think it's too much too soon. The only thing I would say, and I thought this last night was, there was a time when we had a front three of Rashford, Martial and Greenwood. And I've mentioned it before. And I was just like, oh, I think it was the COVID season. I think it was the season that COVID happened. And I just thought with that front three, there's just no way this is not going to be revolutionary for Manchester United. Greenwood, Rashford, Martial, this is going to be amazing. And then you look at where we are. Well, COVID was 2020. So what? Four years later, Martial's about to walk out the door for free. Greenwood's on loan in Spain. And Rashford is a very divisive player within the Man United fan base. I.e. some people just don't like him and want him to be sold. Some people still really like him. But it's not where I thought we would be with those three players. And that is the only thing that worries me about Akobe Mainu Is that we've been in this position before where we've had young players that we think are absolutely amazing and then three or four years later it doesn't come to fruition and Manchester United have got a huge part to play in that of course you've got to look at the individual you know and there's three different stories there of course there are but what we need to do as a football club is learn from those mistakes or maybe not even mistakes just stories you know sometimes it's not a mistake sometimes it's a story um we need to make sure that when Kobe Mayne is 22, he's still the exciting, potential world-beating player he is. And I don't know whether United have been great at that in the last few years. Like, off-field activities, who they, who, the, who, who their agents are, you know, things like that. Man United might not be able to control it, but he is a Man United player. That's the thing that concerns me. I don't really care that he's playing for England, really. I'd like to see him have a rest. But... We've seen so many players go off the rails at Manchester United for various reasons, you know. And I think the Greenwood, Martial, Rashford trilogy are three very different reasons why they're not the player I thought they were going to be. Three ridiculously different reasons. Let's not even compare them. You know, Martial's story is different to Greenwood's. Rashford's story is different to Martial's. But all three of them have not realised the talents they have at Manchester United. And that's the thing about Mainu, I would say. It's just something for the club to be aware. Hopefully, Kobe Mainu's aware of it. You know, you, you're not set for life at 18. There are warning signs there that you can you can wander down different pathways and it and it doesn't work out. And it's the same for Ganacho and it's the same for Rasmus. That's my biggest concern because I think people run away with themselves. They go, oh, Kobe Mainu's going to be the... I mean, I heard somebody else was calling him the next Kante. I mean, he's Kante, he's Seedorf, he's Wilshire, he's Pogba, he's Kobe Mainu. Like, come on. But what we need to do as United fans is have our eyes wide open because there's too many people in our fan base who are just, you know, chanting and, you know, predicting he's going to be the best player that England's ever seen. But we have been in this position before. We need to be patient and we need to have our eyes open because there's plenty of players at United who've gone off the rails as young, talented players recently. Didn't happen with the class of 92, but our, our recent legacy, and this is a job for Ineos, our recent legacy with young players is that they go off the rails. Um, we don't have a great success rate with young players. We don't. Even though, I mean, I remember Yanisai was going to be the next big thing. Didn't, didn't do it. Um, that we, we name me a player in the last 10 years that's broken through at United as a teenager and gone on six years later to be better than they were as a teenager and an established first team player. And there isn't one. There isn't. The, the closest is Rashford. But as I said, he divides opinion. So that's the thing that we need to be not concerned about, but eyes opened about. That's the only concern I've got, is where Maynou's going to be in four years' time and what we're doing as a club to make sure that he does become this amazing player that I think he can. Uh, can you wish my girlfriend Hayley a very happy birthday? She's stuck at work today, says Scott. Why is she working on her birthday? I suppose it is a Tuesday. Happy birthday to Hayley. Uh, Gary, says, uh, Gary says, give us a morning sneeze. I don't know where it is. I'm a bit worried. I don't know where it is. Don't ever mention Scott McTominay. Bloody Scott McTominay's not even a talent. Like we're talking about genuine talent. Like we're talking Greenwood, Martial, Rashford, Mainu, Ganacho, 
and you lot are talking about McTominay. Come on. He's, um, no. It, well, yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, I'll tell you what I was, here, 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 here's something for you. They need to be looked after, Carlos. Yes, Manchester United need to do a lot better on, you know, looking after our younger players because, as I said, I'm not blaming United for what happened with Greenwood or Martial or Rashford or any other, or Yanisai or any other player that didn't really fulfil their talent, but we can do better. We can do better. Um... I'm not talking about McTominay, sorry. Um, there's a player, I don't know whether he's going to play for Belgium tonight, and I can't pronounce his name, but I don't, I actually, I don't even know why I'm mentioning him. What's his name? The Ke the, the Can you remember him? Um, I just, I was, thinking, I was thinking, I was thinking about him the other day. I was like, where is he now? I think he's on loan at Atalanta, isn't he? From AC Milan. I was just trying to think of some strikers that we might go for that are a little bit younger because we're not going to get Tony. We're not going to get Ferguson. And I was trying to think of a striker that we could go for in the summer that um, that that might be a little bit left field that nobody's really talking about at the moment. But um, it's tough. It's really tough. And I think the, 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 the big problem that we do have is that we... We are stuck in this no man land, no, no man's land at the moment, or, or no woman's land, or whatever. It's um, the plans aren't in place. I, I I don't want to panic people, but the plans are not in place. We are scouting people, we are talking to players, we are talking to agents, but there's no definitive plan at the moment around around what we're going to look at and and how we're going to do it. So. You know, I, I read something this morning about Man United's double Brazilian swoop. And I was like, oh, I don't want to read it. I don't want to read it. It's going to be the biggest load of shit ever. And I clicked it and it was like Man United in hundred million pound Brazilian double swoop. And I looked at who it was and it was Gomez from Wolves and it was Bremer from Juventus. And I was like, oh, my God, this is regurgitated shit. Like it's. We are not looking at a hundred million pound swoop for Gomez from Wolves and Bremer from Juventus. Um, we're not. We're just. Not, we're not going to do that. I mean, the headline itself just dictates that is not what we're going to do. Um, so, I, I, but look, as I said, for me, the priority positions are two centre backs that get us up the pitch, a right back that competes with Delo and does what Delo does, not a defensive right back. A left back is now essential, obviously, because Malassia is not going to be playing, obviously. So they're my four priorities. It's basically a back four. Um, and as somebody said in the chat, you know, you don't need a back four when you've got Delo, Martinez, Varane and Shaw. But when you haven't got those four, the other back four is completely different. I mean, it's like having a, a Man United back four and then when they're not fit a Stoke City back four it's literally 20 metres back the low to wan is defensive Varane to Maguire is 20 metres back Martinez to Lindelof or Evans is 20 metres back and Luke Shaw to well we haven't even got a fucking left back so we do need they are priority positions we have a first choice back four but when they get injured We've got no, we've got nobody that can play the way they play. So we need a whole back four, in my opinion. That's a priority. Um, we definitely need a Casemiro replacement, whether he stays or not. We need somebody who can do that role, and we definitely need a Hoyland, you know, option. Um, they're the six priorities. The fact that we're looking at my, look, I like Elise, and I think there's a very big chance that we're going to sign Elise. But I will say it. Why? It's a bit like Mason Mount last summer. Why? Why would you spend fifty million pounds on somebody that isn't in a priority position? You've got Rashford, you've got Ganacho, you've got Anthony, you've got Ahmad, you've still got Sancho, Greenwood, and Palestri. All three of them might go. Alisi for fifty million quid, it's not a priority. But we, we we may well end up doing one of those types of signings again. Who knows? Um, I'd get two centre backs, a right back, a left back, a centre midfielder, a striker, and a right winger, says Del Boy. Well, look, if we get all of those, happy days. But the right winger being last is correct, because for me, the other positions are 
more priority. Danny Esther says, what, what a great name. Mark, it's about to be a long transfer window. We look so short of players and availability in the market is short. How does Eric Ten Hag and Ineos pull this off? I don't know because, you know, I was speaking to somebody last week and they were saying the problem that you've got is Barad has never worked with Ashworth. Barad has never worked with Ten Hag. Ashworth's never worked with Ten Hag. So those three people have never worked. That's a triangle that no, has never worked together and can't work together till at least June. And that, that was it for me. I was sort of like, bloody hell, it's good, isn't it? CEO, director of football and manager never worked together, probably never spoken to each other and can't speak to each other until at least June. And that's if Man United get Ashworth out of the contract. Remember, Newcastle don't want him to start work till Christmas. So biggest summer transfer window in years, three major components haven't spoken to each other and won't do till June. You can't start your January. You start. You can't start your summer. I don't know. I don't look. I genuinely don't know, and nobody's really talking about it because I think I think the press is still living up the up the arse of the club and Ineos. But it's not that we're not. It's just that we're asking the right questions. How is this summer transfer window going to work when we've got loads of experience? That if you want to make an impact in the window, you've got to be getting your players lined up today in March. But we know that Ten Hag and Barada and Ashworth can't speak to each other. So how is this working? Who, in the absence of, what does Sir Jim do? Well, Ashworth can't be involved at the moment, so we can't listen to him. But we will listen to him when he's here. Well, when's he going to be here then? He's he's in control, but he's not in control. Barada's in control, but we can't speak to him till the summer properly. But he is feeding us stuff. Okay. Manager is Ten Hag for now. Okay. So, so right. Sir Jim. Who are we actually, what players are we talking to and who's telling us to talk to those players? Is it Tenag? Can't be Ashworth. Is it Barada? Is it Murta? Is it you? Who are we talking to and why are we talking to them to sign them? Or are we going to wait till June? And, and this is the question at the moment that people are asking. It's like, yeah, United are going to have a big summer transfer window. And this is happening with sales as well. Like, oh, Tenhag says let's sell Maguire. Ashworth's not so sure. Barada says sell him. Are, are we selling him? Does he does he want to go? You know, all this is going on at the moment. And if you're Man City or you're Arsenal, you're sat there in March going, hello, you're the CEO, you're the director of football, I'm the manager, we've worked together before, we're working together now, I want this player from Juventus, I want this player from Everton. <sighs> Let's go to Nando's. You know, we are ill-prepared again. At the moment, we are ill-prepared. And it's not necessarily anybody's fault, but we are. We are very ill-prepared for this summer transfer window because nobody really knows who's in control. Nobody knows when we're going to have that control. So do you move ahead with the old regime or do you go, we don't trust that regime. We're waiting for the new regime that's not here yet. What do you do? Um, and, and, and that's something we're going to have to hopefully sort out. Um why didn't we go for Paul Mitchell, says Terp? Well, because they want Dan Ashworth. That is their, that is their right, isn't it? But, uh, you know. Um, Ian McDonald says, you know full well everyone's involved, whether, whether on gardening duty or not. Well, Ian, I'd be surprised if there weren't conversations ongoing. But I'll tell you for free, if any email or WhatsApp ever dropped out from Dan Ashworth to... Sir David Brailsford or Sir Jim Radcliffe, we would be fined massively. And do you think Newcastle would like to catch us doing that? So you say, oh, yeah, you know, they're on gardening leave. They'll still be having conversations. I'm telling you now, if it, it wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't surprise me if there were conversations going on, but it wouldn't be surprising to me if there weren't because the risk factor of getting caught is massive. And... You know, how do you do it? Send it by pigeon. You can't get photographed. Oh, let, let's meet up in, in Chester. We'll meet up at the Costa in the centre of Chester. No one will see us there. I'm, oh, massive Man United fan, Dave. Oh, can I have a picture of you and Dan? I don't know. I don't know how it works. You know, maybe maybe Dan Ashworth is feeding play names. But on the other hand, would you want Dan Ashworth to be feeding players to Manchester United at the moment? He hasn't been to the training ground. He hasn't spoken to the manager. He hasn't spoken to the current players. How does he know to sell Scott McTominay or, or, or Victor Lindelof? So 
I don't even think Ashworth has any value in his garden sending WhatsApp messages to sell this player and buy this player because he hasn't been into the club to actually understand what's going on either. So he could have a burner phone, says Andre. Look, honestly, Ian makes a good point, but that just shows you the chaos that we're operating in at the moment. Is our summer transfer window being run from a burner phone in Dan Ashworth's garden? And if it is, how dangerous is that when he hasn't been to Carrington? When he hasn't spoken to players or the manager? So I don't know. Would you rather it was run from a burner phone in Dan Ashworth's garden or would you rather it was being run by Murta and Ten Hag like it was last year? Um, <laughs> but but welcome to Man United's transfer summer policy. And that's the, that's the ridiculous um, nature of it. Highgate Up says, well, he could be watching videotapes. I'm sure he's bored of watching that sort of stuff. But yeah, he could be doing that. Um, Del Boy says, I like Hatto from Ajax. He is a centre-back naturally, but can play left-back. I know exactly who you mean. I think I had him on my FIFA career mode. Um, he said, it, look, what we need is, and I'm tired of saying it myself, we need some, we need the end game on, on Dan Ashworth. We need to just get that deal sorted because we need that director of football. They should be at the football club now. Um, and if we're if we're trying to negotiate that deal down to save five million quid, that worries me about how much money we've got. I said it a few weeks ago. If I can get Dan Ashworth into the club today as director of football for 15 million quid, or I can keep negotiating it down to five million and get it done by the end of April, I'd spend the 15. I'd spend the 15 because he will make that money back by being involved now. Um, and the fact that we're negotiating it down is a little bit concerning about how much money we've actually got available. But I don't know the truth on that. I don't know. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Make sure you smash a like on the video and subscribe. We're back at two o'clock. Tonight's show is seven o'clock because I'm doing a watch along, a menu. Well, I was doing England, Belgium anyway, but I'm going to call it a menu watch along. Um, Yes, he's expected to start for England tonight. So we'll definitely be watching that. So it'll be a seven o'clock show tonight. Take care, everyone. Smash a like on the video and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Take care.